my wife and I are heading up to Canada for six weeks to document a horse trail in and two sheep putts. Here is the camera gear that we are bringing. Quick general framework for this photo project assignment. So it's basically break it into three. So for the first two to three weeks, we're going to be packing in horses into a remote area into BC. And then for the second segment, it's gonna be a 10 day sheep hunt. And for the third segment, it's going to be a father daughter sheep hunt with Dustin Rowe and his oldest daughter, Nevaeh. The first two portions are primarily photography slash random video clips slash Instagram reel type things. And then the hunt with Dustin and his daughter is primarily going to be filmed. So that said, let's dive into all the gear we're bringing and why. So first off, lenses. Not sure if I'm gonna pack this lens around, but this lens is the Sony 200 to 600. It's my primary wildlife lens. And you're just able to get some really unique shots, primarily of wildlife or landscapes. Um, if I took it on a hunt, uh, you could get some really sweet, just really tight shots of hunters, or there could be someone a thousand yards away on a ridge line. You could zoom in with this guy and it would look semi-normal. So 200 to 600, it's going with, I don't know if we're gonna be taking it on the hunts per se, but definitely have it in the vehicle. Also, we're driving up. It's like a three and a half day drive. And because we're driving up, we're able to bring a little more gear than normal. So first lens, 200 to 600 from Sony. Next lens, this is the Sony 70 to 200 f 2.8. Of all the photos I've ever shot, the ones that get used the most, the ones that have maybe made me the most money, the ones that have seen the most light of day by brands or on Instagram or whatever, have been shot with this lens. Uh, I've had many models of this exact lens, but it's basically been 7200 f 2.8 from Canon, Sony, whomever. Uh, this thing produces absolute gold. So this guy definitely going. Next lens is the Sony 14 mil f 1.8. Uh, this is a super wide angle lens. Awesome for starscapes, awesome for landscapes. Awesome for anything you need a super wide angle lens for, uh, and it also goes to f 1.8. You can, I don't know, this is just, this is just a sweet, sharp little lens. Uh, probably the best, widest lens out there, in my opinion, of course. Next lens is the Sony 20mm f 2.0. Karen will primarily be rocking this lens. Really great wide angle, not very expensive, produces epic results. And then next up from that is this Zeiss Betis 25mm f 2.0. Uh, really small form factor in this lens. Shoots epic photos, it's nice and small. I'm a big fan of prime lenses, primarily because you can get lower aperture out of them, so you can shoot in lower light, you can add more creative depth of field. Uh, love prime lenses. Next up, this has been my favorite lens that I've had in the past year. This is a 35mm f1.8. Uh, just a sweet focal length, the low aperture, you know, the combination of those two, you can just get some really dreamy, cool images. Next, we've got the Tamron 28 to 75 f2.8. Traditionally, I would always bring a Sony 24 to 70, but my most recent 24 to 70 kind of fell down a mountain. It still works, it's still sharp as ever, but it doesn't, the focus reel doesn't really spin very well. So my replacement is this Tamron 28 to 75. I've taken it on one hunt so far, and it's sharp as ever. It's also quite a bit lighter than the Sony version. Um, Kind of my only downside is that it's a 28 to 75 instead of a 24. Uh, that lack of four millimeters on the wide end uh, makes me not like this lens as much. Up from that, we've got the Zeiss Betis 85 mil f1.8. This is a sweet little lens. It basically provides the same look and feel of a 70 to 200, but in a much smaller package. Um, it is a prime lens, so if you want to zoom, you have to physically move. There's not a zoom wheel or anything on it, uh, but the low aperture and everything, I mean, it's just a badass little lens. So if you are looking to cut a little weight and you don't want to carry the 7200 around, uh, Zeiss Betis 1.885 is a good route. Next lens is the Sony 24 to 240 f3.5 to 6.3. So. I got this lens kind of as a trial piece just to see how good it was because the zoom range from 24 to 240 is like 
quite huge. I mean, you could basically do almost everything on this lens. The problem is, is you know, it doesn't really have a low aperture, which so shooting in low light or trying to get some creative depth of field options, you don't really get with this lens. But in all brighter light conditions and most things I've shot, like this is a pretty sick lens. And from a video standpoint especially, I mean, in one lens you can go from 24 and basically get wider shots of people talking or people doing stuff. You know, you can zoom all the way into 240 and possibly shoot wildlife stuff with this lens. And it's probably five and a half, six inches tall and not that heavy. So if you are looking for one lens to potentially do it all, this guy, 24 to 240, might be your bet. But if you're looking for more creative applications, lower apertures, more creative depth of field, I'd probably be steering you towards Prime. And last camera lens is the 50mm f1.8. For this trip, we're pretty much bringing everything but the kitchen sink, and that's because we're gone for six weeks, it's because we're driving, we have the ability to take more gear than normal, and also because the place we're going, it's pretty rugged, and if we break some gear, I kind of want to have duplicates or other options while we're out there. Uh, usually my lens setup or something like this, if I was air traveling, would be probably just three to four lenses. For wildlife footy at longer distances, I am bringing my Swarovski 65mm spotting scope and my Swaro 12x42 NL Peers. When you put your cell phone up to these guys through an adapter like a phone scope or a mag view or an all-in, you can get some really crazy good quality footage and you know the spotters maybe three thousand bucks and the equivalent zoom range you'd have to pay for something like a giant lens i mean you'd be paying like twelve hundred dollars for a huge say a 600 mil f4 so way smaller way better what's even smaller is bringing binos sticking your uh, binos on a tripod and filming through them so this is a way better cheaper way to go and you can get some really sweet footage Oh yeah, there's one more lens. It's the one that I'm filming with right now. This is a Zeiss Betis 18mm f2.8 and it accepts an ND filter on the front, so it's great for video and it's pretty wide and small. It's a pretty sweet wide angle lens. Next up is every Sony battery I own. Again, on most of these trips, it's gonna be both Karen and I running probably two cameras each. So there might be four cameras out at all times running, which is kind of insane. And typically I plan on burning through two batteries per day. That would just be one of us. So with two of us, we may at a max be burning through four batteries a day. So if we're out for 10 days, I technically need 40 batteries and the most batteries I have is uh, I think 24. So good luck. <laughs> Primary camera bodies are gonna be the A7R5. Got two of them. We've also got an a7 IV, we've got an a7R3 as a backup photo camera, and then we've got an a7S3 as a backup video camera. Oh, also our cell phones. Uh, we do so much stuff with our cell phones these days from Instagram reels to just footage of wildlife through our phones to just walking and videoing stuff at high res for various Instagram reel stuff. So the old phones these days, they do a lot of stuff. So Karen, we just got her an iPhone 14 Pro. I've got an iPhone 13 Pro. So we're all pro'd out. Hopefully we get something pro. <laughs> These are two memory card cases. These are both from Think Tank. And what I like about them, so this one has got zippered see-through pouches. I've got tape on the top here. So when I use a memory card, I can put tape over the terminals. And that will indicate that the card is full and I need to dump uh, the memory card before I put it back in the camera and format it. So this yellow one, this is an older Think Tank case and the cards are more exposed. But one thing that's really crucial for any photography trip or assignment is to have redundancy. So we're gonna have two memory card cases, both with basically the same amount and type of memory cards. And so if we by chance happen to lose one of these, at least we won't be out of memory cards on the whole trip. That said, in this camera that's running right now, I've got two one terabyte 
CF Express Type A cards, and in theory, that'll be plenty big enough for the entire trip, and I won't have, ever have to uh, swap out memory cards. So that's the hope. Um, hopefully, they don't go corrupt on me or something. But next up, I've got ND filters for every single lens that I have, and what these do is they reduce the amount of light coming in which allows me to keep a slower shutter speed, which is ideal for video. Uh, say you're shooting 24 frames per second, the ideal shutter speed is 1 50th of a second. If you're shooting 60 frames per second, you wanna keep your shutter speed at 1 20th. So basically double, or as close to double as you can get. If you're shooting 120 frames per second, you wanna shoot 1 2 50th of a shutter speed. And really the only way to do that, while also keeping potentially a low aperture, make it a little more creative, is to use ND filters. The other application would be if I wanted to do kind of a slower shutter shot. Um, say I wanted to either drag the shutter or do kind of a long exposure in the middle of the day during bright sun. The only way to do that would be to use an ND filter. Next, these are all USB rechargeable battery bricks. I've got 10,000 MHAs all the way to 20,000 MHAs. And basically what these are gonna allow me to do is recharge my phone when I'm in the field, recharge camera batteries to some extent. Um, I'll have some Rode Wireless 2 microphones um, for our video shoot that I'll be able to recharge with these. Uh, I've got like 10 of these things, so pack as many as we can, just kind of think about how much we'll actually use and go from there. If we are in the field and we have a down day and there's lots of sun, I am bringing this solar charger. This is a big blue 28 watt solar charger and when you have all the panels out in the middle of a midday sun, you might be able to charge two camera batteries with it. Uh, it's amazing how inefficient solar is. Um, you could definitely charge your phones and stuff with it, but charging devices that take a little bit more power is definitely tricky, but I'm gonna bring this on the rare chance that we do get some down days and be able to charge some stuff up and keep shooting. The primary microphones we'll be using. First up, this is a shotgun mic, mounts on the top, put a little dead cat over it. Uh, this is a Sennheiser MKE 400. And one really nice thing is when you plug it in, you know, you don't have to worry about turning this on and off every time. When you turn your camera on, the microphone will automatically turn on. And I run two lithium AAAs in here and they last forever. I really have never had to worry about battery life. Every few months I'll change them, but I, it's not like they're dying constantly. The other microphone setup we're using is this guy right here. This is the Rode Wireless Go 2. This is a wireless lav mic setup. You've got a transceiver and then you've got two receivers. You, know, you can mount one of these on your camera. You can mount another one on your subject. You can mount two on your subject. It records independent audio up channels. Uh, there's a bunch of different options. I've had this guy for a few years now and they're freaking awesome. You can also record video and get like really good sound when someone's 100 yards away. So you can hear someone whispering when they're 100 yards away from the camera and it just uh, adds a cool vibe and feel to your videos when you can like hear things but be filming from 100 yards away. So wireless labs have uh, kind of been game changer. This right here is a rain cover for your camera. It's basically a glorified garbage bag. It's got two openings with two holes on either side. Your camera goes in the middle. And then this part kind of wraps around the front of your lens and it allows you to shoot in the middle of a dumping rainstorm. So I've got a number of these. These are like five bucks on Amazon for a two pack. Uh, probably the best way to weatherproof your cameras and allow you to continue to shoot in bad weather, which I would argue is the best time to shoot photos for so many reasons, but primarily because emotion is most prevalent when the weather absolutely sucks and when someone's getting pelted in the face with rain and like there's just so much emotion there and as a viewer you can look at that photo and be like wow like I can really connect with that photo and uh, think of it this way like if you have somebody walking up a ridge and it's a beautiful bluebird day it's like yeah cool photo but if you have somebody walking up a ridge and it's super cloudy and stormy and they got their rain gear on and they're just getting pelted, pelted in the face with rain it's just way cooler so I love shooting in bad weather. Um, some of my best images, some of my favorite images have come from shooting in such conditions and the best way to do that is with one of these little rain covers. So this one specifically, I think it's a Rugard rain cover. 
Uh, again, Amazon, five bucks for a two pack. We are bringing five tripods on this trip. Uh, this first one over here on my left is, it's a Delkin Systems, basically, it's a table clamp with a tripod thingy on the end of it, so you can like clamp it to anything and then mount a camera onto the end. Uh, really awesome for clamping it onto just weird locations. I shoot in the camp a lot with this guy. And then I've just got three regular tripods. Uh, two of them are Surui uh, T024X tripods with a little ball head, and then this one in the middle here. This is a loophole. Uh, I think Alpine tripod with a ball head, and I mean, just can never have enough tripods. Also, we won't be packing all this stuff with us while we're out in the field. We'll kind of have like a base camp with all of our extra stuff, which will include all these things. As I said earlier, it's good to have redundancy, so having backups to literally everything could be really useful. And the last thing I'll be covering is how I'll be carrying my cameras. So I will have a camera on my chest at all times and I'll keep it in this Mystery Ranch camera case. It's basically a zippered compartment that mounts on my chest, similar to a binocular harness. Uh, plenty big enough for pretty much every lens except for a zoom, like 70 to 200. Anything pretty much under 70 to 200 uh, will fit in this guy. But it's got additional pockets on the top. It's got a big pocket up front. It's got some mounting stuff on the bottom so I can mount my bear spray under here. It's got some big pockets in the side for both my air puffer as well as a uh, rain cover. It's also nice because, you know, A, your camera's always accessible, and B, it's just protected a little bit more than being fully open and exposed to getting banged on or snowed on or rained on or sleeted on or blowing the sand in on. Karen and I will each have one of these, all of the Mystery Ranch version, and she'll have this older style, it's called a Click Elite. They no longer make it, which is crazy. This thing was so awesome, but same exact concept as this guy, just a little bit bigger. And of course, cotton carrier system. I will have this mounted on the shoulder strap in my backpack, and there's a base plate that goes on the bottom of the camera, slides right into this guy here, and allows you to carry a camera on your backpack while providing instant, quiet, quick accessibility to your camera. That was almost all the camera gear taken up to BC slash Yukon on this trip. Uh, there's still more things from cleaning supplies to a few lighting things, etc. cetera, but uh, I won't dive into all those details because they're obnoxious, but um, anyway, next for us is a three and a half day, 30 plus hour road trip to Canada. So we'll uh, see you when we start doing that. Thank you.